Thank you, Tatiana. Now I'd like to pass the floor for the welcome remarks to the Vice Rector of the National School of Judges of Ukraine, Steve Natalia Shuklina. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Nana, as you've mentioned already, the National School of Judges of Ukraine, through the friendly cooperation with the American Judicial College, is having now the ninth webinar, and this is on disciplinary uh, uh, proceedings against the judges of the United States. We are very thankful to our friends and colleagues from the USAD, the Justice Program for initiating and establishing this friendly professional relations with the American Judicial College, which has now made it possible for us to participate in these webinars, which are very important in view of their topics for our realities. This topic is really relevant, important, and painful for our judges and for our judicial system. The law on judicial system and status of judges established that the disciplinary authority in Ukraine is the High Council of Justice of Ukraine and its disciplinary chambers. The disciplinary chamber of this council conducts disciplinary proceedings and the High Council of Justice then can review their decisions as an appeal instance. Uh, the law on judicial system and status of judges also identifies the grounds for application of disciplinary sanctions against a judge. But we can say that the mechanism of uh, the implementation of this uh, disciplinary liability of judge, uh, uh, judges is far from being perfect. Uh, so that's why we've invited to participate in this webinar, not only the Ukrainian judges, uh, but also we've invited the members of High Council of uh, Justice, uh, their respective inspectors from the service of inspectors, because they are the individuals who are, some, so to say, the front line on the implement of the implementation of this law. We invited the the representatives of the Secretariat of the High Council of Judges and also the staff members of the court. It's uh, our agenda for today, as suggested by our colleagues from American Judicial College, is very interesting and important for us. Important and interesting from the professional point of view, because here I think we'll receive answers to very important question. How does the disciplinary liability institution works in the United States. What is the mechanism to ensure that the judges comply with the code of ethics and code of judicial conduct? What are the criteria and grants for uh, holding uh, judges liable through disciplinary procedures? Also, an important point is um, uh, about the criteria of how to strike the right balance between uh, the disciplinary liability of judges and respect for their private life. Uh, also, we wonder who can initiate disciplinary compliance against a judge. What are the criteria to hold the judgeship uh, uh, liable, uh, whether any court sentence can constitute grounds for application of disciplinary sanctions against a judge. Uh, I think um, uh, all these questions will be answered through this during the speeches of esteemed Brooks Sample and Honorable Phyllis Scotty. Now we uh, want to thank uh, the Near Justice Program and the uh, uh, employees of American Judicial College, and uh, we are very thankful for choosing this topic uh, as uh, uh, for this uh, last uh, webinar in this current series of, uh, of the 
webinars uh, mean the generality of judges so that we can make comparisons uh, of how we do it in Ukraine. I'm sure that uh, the representatives of High Council of Justice, and this is the constitutional authority in Ukraine, the way we would be able to maybe borrow some practices uh, from uh, the United States uh, institutions and uh, then maybe we'll have better opportunities for amending the law on judicial system and status of justice to make this law better meet the expectations concerning the judiciary. Now I'd like to offer the floor to our partners, Mr. Talia Petrova, who is deputy the manager of the program of USAID program. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. I'm really happy to welcome all of you on behalf of our program. I certainly support all these uh, good words um, uh, said uh, with regard to our partners from the National Judicial College of the United States. Uh, indeed, uh, this event concludes a cycle or series of the webinars, uh, which uh, have uh, uh, drawn attention of many judges who participated in these events. They certainly then shared the received information with their colleagues. All these webinars were recorded, and all of those who have such desire can really uh, reproduce them in your computers. Uh, talking about the uh, disciplinary liability of uh, yes, uh, judges is a very important topic. The institution of disciplinary liability is the reverse side of judicial independence. Uh, and the disciplinary liability of judges is an element of uh, judicial accountability because independence of judiciary and of each specific judge is not absolute. Uh, we know from a number of international documents that judicial independence uh, as a principle and as a, as a guarantee is granted to judges, not just for their benefit, but for the benefit of all those who seek judges expecting unbiased decision of his or her case according to the law. So the disciplinary liability is an extremely important institution within the um, system of public authorities. The parliaments of the countries decide how the system should be operated recently. We amend that constitution, including the provisions on High Council of Justice. Uh, and you know, this institution of disciplinary, uh, disciplinary liability uh, has, was amended. Also, you'll hear about serious differences uh, between us and the United States with regard to confidential. Uh, confidentiality of disciplinary proceedings. Uh, I'll tell you then that when we had the debates uh, at the Presidential Commission in 2016-17, there were some thoughts that maybe uh, the fact of uh, filing a complaint against a judge should not be made public right away because the facts can be confirmed or not confirmed, and that may certainly have impact over the reputation of both judge and the judiciary as a health. So I don't want to take any more of your time. I want to thank our colleagues from Judicial College, the Brooks Sample, for this laborious efforts that she has implemented to make sure that all these nine webinars are conducted successfully. Thank you. Good and interesting event and good discussion to all of you. Thank you, Natalia. Now let me offer the floor to the legal advisor of the National Judicial College in the United States. This is Brooks Sample. And also I'd like to support uh, the uh, words of thanks uh, that have been expressed uh, 
by Ms. Petrova and also uh, on behalf of our school, I want to express our gratitude for this highly professional cooperation between your college and National School of Judges at Ukraine. Our thanks also on behalf of all participants of today's webinar. So actually the floor is um, offered to Brooke Sampolo. Thank you very much for that great introduction. And thank you everyone for joining us. We have enjoyed uh, putting this series on for you and hope that you have found each of the webinars uh, to be informative and helpful to you and your work. It's my great pleasure to introduce the Honorable Phyllis Williams Cote. Judge Cote is a senior judge, came to Florida International University College of Law in Florida here in the United States in 2004 with a distinguished record of service to the bench and bar. She is a clinical professor of law and director of externships and pro bono programs. As director of the legal externship program, she has assisted students in judicial, civil, and criminal placements at the local, state, and national levels. She has facilitated student-initiated pro bono service in Colombia South America and around the, the country, including New Orleans, Louisiana, here in the US after Hurricane Katrina. In 2012, she was selected as a Fulbright United States Scholar for the 2012-2013 academic year in Accra, Ghana. Judge Cote has taught criminal procedure, children in the law, the American Caribbean Law Initiative Seminar and community law teaching street law in the Miami-Dade Juvenile Detention Center in Florida. She also teaches bar preparation courses in the areas of Florida constitutional law and Florida criminal procedure. She is a member of numerous bar associations, the author of public financing for nonpartisan ju judicial campaigns, protecting judicial independence while ensuring judicial impartiality, and the real costs of judicial misconduct Florida taking a step ahead of the regulation on ju of judicial speech and conduct to ensure independence, integrity, and impartiality among other publications. She holds a bachelor and master degrees and her Juris Doctorate from the University of Florida. She is an alumna here of the, at the National Judicial College. And she joined our faculty in 2001 and is considered one of our distinguished faculty. She is currently serving her first term on the National Judicial College Faculty Council. And with that, I turn the floor over to the Honorable Phyllis Cote. Thank you. And good day. I bring you greetings from Miami and we'll be speaking to you for the next hour or so on the issue of judicial discipline in the United States. Next slide. It is our hope that as a result of, of this webinar, that you will be better able to identify speech and conduct that may constitute judicial misconduct and violate judicial ethics, uh, describe the components of effective judicial disciplinary proceedings and balance that of course with judicial accountability and independence. And hopefully we'll do that by looking at examples. Next slide and understanding the importance of judicial misconduct proceedings. And in looking at judicial conduct proceedings, we'll examine um, the whole aspect of judicial misconduct proceedings from the complaint stage, going then to the investigation stage, following with the hearing stage, and finally looking at the, the possibility of sanctions and the imposition of sanctions in terms of judicial misconduct proceedings. Next slide. When we talk about this issue of disciplinary case considerations, one of the most important uh, considerations that we will discuss today is listening and understanding the role of media and the role of citizens in initiating disciplinary cases for judicial conduct. And in looking at and understanding this role, of course, we will be asked to determine the balance or examine the balance between transparency and confidentiality in these judicial 
uh, discipline proceedings. And finally, uh, learning or looking at the obligation um, of judges and their responsibilities as it relates to reporting judicial obligations and reporting misconduct that may be observed by a judge. Next slide. So we'll start off by looking at this issue of the judiciary, the public, and media, and examining the roles that um, each of these entities uh, can play in looking at judicial misconduct or judicial discipline proceedings. In beginning our discussion, next slide, about this, I'd like to introduce uh, Justice John Paul Stevens. Uh, justice Stevens uh, was a Supreme Court justice or a justice in the highest court um, in the United States until he retired in, in 2010. Uh, but Justice Stevens spotlighted or created a spotlight on the role of media in shaping public opinion about the judiciary. And in creating the spotlight, uh, specifically, Judge Justice uh, Stevens looked at the results of the election in 2000, in which uh, President Bush was elected and his component was uh, former Vice President Al Gore. The issue um, ended up going to the Supreme Court and there ended up being a decision by the Supreme Court. And this is the quote and the response of Justice Stevens to the activity of the court. And as you note, he retired in 2010. So he was actually a part of, of, of this decision. The quote, next slide. Although we may never know with complete certainty the identity of the winners of this year's presidential election, the identity of the loser is clear. It is the nation's confidence in the judge as an impartial guardian of the rule of law. And it is this role of the judge as the impartial guardian of the rule of law that I would like you to examine first. And I want you to think about what is meant when we talk about impartial guardian of law? What comes to your mind when we think about the role of a judge as an impartial guardian in the rule of law? Next slide. So as we talk about the judge as an impartial guardian of the rule of law, we get to our first poll question. And I'll ask you to be put up. And I'll ask you to think about as we discuss this judge as the impartial guardian of the rule of law. So the question for you, which statement do you most agree with? First, a judge should not be subject to discipline for speech or conduct that only gives a perception that it violates the oath as an impartial guardian of the rule of law. Next, a judge should only be subject to discipline for speech or conduct that actually violates the oath as an impartial guardian of law. And finally, a judge should be subject to discipline for speech and conduct that may give a perception and that actually violates the oath as an impartial guardian of the rule of law. I'll ask that you vote at this time, which of those statements you most agree with. With which of those statements do you most agree with? Шановні учасники, голосуйте, будь ласка. 
dear participants, you're invited to vote. Ten seconds more, and then we'll see the result. Thank you. So as I as we look at the polling results, 8% of you thought that um, this the perception uh, should subject a judge to a violation of the um, to a judge if there's to subject a judge to um, discipline if the violation is in, is is a is of the perception. Um, interestingly enough, most of you looked at the issue of only if the judge actually, actually violates this oath as the impartial um, guardian of the rule of law, should they be, be, be disciplined. And then about an equal number, although um, a little less, felt that both the, imp the perception and the reality of this violation should subject a judge to discipline. So for someone that felt um, that only if it actually um, violates, if you can just write into the chat uh, for me, you know, why, why, why should only actual violations of the oath be subject to discipline? So anyone at this time, I mean, and, and if, if each of you felt that only actual uh, violations should be reported, why is that? And again, there are no right or wrong answers in terms of, of, of these, these uh, statements, but we will talk about best practices in terms of it. I'm unable to see, so are we getting comments or not? It will sometimes takes just a few minutes for them to come in and judges we welcome you to explain your answer of why you believe that um, it should just be actual violations. And you can send a chat. Шановні учасники, напишіть, будь ласка, пару ваших думок у чат. А я зачитаю. Ми вже маємо. Yes, let me read. It's very difficult to assess objectively unless there has been the actual violation. There may be many Manipulative uh, approach to uh, share information about the judge's behavior. Only actual speech or behavior would undermine the uh, reputation of the judiciary and generate distrust. Uh, another one, the, the punishment should be predictable. An individual needs to understand very clearly what is improper behavior. Another one. So judges, such as I read, I'm sorry, go ahead. Such uh, actions, uh, if such actions of the judge have uh, led to violation of citizens' right, uh, uh, to protection of which is actually the judicial obligation. Another one, if I may, the judge should uh, 
be responsible for specific actions, not uh, perceptions, because a perception right. may be mistaken. So what about some of you or any of you that identify um, the third question as being your the statement you agree with more? That the judge should be subject for both the perception um, and the actual violation. Why did you think perception should be included? And again, just writing into the comment. Все те, що дійсно становить, становить порушення і те, що створює... Це в «is a violation» о «generates perception of a violation» «damages judiciary to the equal extent» That's why both um, undermine the authority of the judiciary and needs to be responded, need to be responded. Another consideration, if a judge is subject to liability for a behavior that uh, creates perception of a violation, then the controlling authority will have nothing to do but checking all the actions of the judges. And then uh, we cannot even talk about any trust, but I think that was the uh, group two, uh, the previous group. Uh, all right, thank you. So, so judges, as I look at responses, and as we read your responses, your position and the division in the responses um, duplicates the feelings that, that, that generally many judges have felt in the United States. Um, being that only um, actual misconduct should be the subject of a violation. But that, that has not come to be true or come to be the practice in terms of the code that looks at judicial uh, misconduct. In the United States, each state has what we call a code of judicial conduct. And we have a model code that um, each of the states has, has mimicked or copied uh, in terms of creating their own state's code of judicial conduct. And one of the things that the state code of judicial conduct and the model code of judicial conduct, which we'll be using um, as a general reference here today, is that, next this slide, public confidence is eroded by irresponsible and improper conduct. And, and irresponsible and improper conduct can be exemplified either um, by actual misconduct or by the perception of misconduct. Second, that respect for the judicial office really facilitates the orderly conduct of judicial functions. Absent perceptions and, 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 and things that may interfere with ability, the ability of individuals to have confidence in what the judge is doing. So the bottom line is that perception matters. When I, when I talk to judges about the fact that perception matters, one of the things um, that, that we, we point out is that you are a judge 24 hours a day, seven days a week, in spite of your, your feeling that this should not be the case. And in looking at discipline, this is exactly what has happened. Next slide, please. A judge in Texas was, 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 was disciplined for this comment. He wrote, after just one day in office, Trump has managed to achieve something that no one else has been able to do. He got a million fat women out walking. Now the judge in posting this particular comment created outrage 
from many others who saw and observed this behavior. However, one of the things that, that immediately came to mind for others is this is simply perception. The judge has not done anything to anyone. The judge has not acted as a judge in any way, but that position did not come to be the majority position in terms of what, that, what happened. So the question for us becomes, next slide, did this judge face discipline for this behavior? Did the judge, was the judge subject for, to disciplinary action for this behavior? So one of the things we find out as we look at disciplinary uh, behavior in, in, uh, and, and conduct in, in the United States is that it will differ from state to state. But there are general principles that would apply. So in, Flor in Texas, where this case actually um, occurred, because of confidentiality rules governing the investigative functions the disciplinary board or individuals that was in, were in charge of the discipline could not confirm or deny the existence of a investigation against this particular judge for this particular behavior. And it is interesting to note that if in fact there had been um, some sort of disciplinary action against this judge, and it was dismissed, the results and everything about it would have remained confidential. So what happens as a result of these um, rulings that keep such behavior confidential, next slide please, is that the issues of transparency and confidentiality come to light. And it is incumbent that we balance the transparency and confidentiality and understand that they are key components of judicial discipline proceedings. But it's not enough for us to know that transparency and confidentiality are key components. We need to understand how transparency and confidentiality will come to play in looking at the proceeding. Because and unfortunately, or, or the position of many, as the confidentiality uh, remains intact for such proceedings, is that judges hide what is happening for other judges, is that judges cover up behavior of other judges, and that judges are not transparent in terms of what is happening. So that it becomes re very important for us to examine this balance between confidentiality and transparency. And the media, next slide, plays a key role in helping the public to understand what is happening in terms of judicial proceedings. First, the media can play a very important role in identification of this improper conduct. For example, what happened in this particular case with the judge Judge Cote, your audio is. There was outrage in the outrage. Is it gone? Judge Cote, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah, your yeah, your audio kind of froze. So I think some of that was missed. Just a couple of. Perfect. Thank you. So, what I was identifying is the the key role that the media plays. In, in, I, in this transparency and confidentiality. First, in terms of identification, like we had happen um, in this case, the, the newspapers and television reported the Facebook posts of this judge. They reported what has happened. Along with reporting the conduct of the judge um, in the post on Facebook, the, the newspaper also educated the public about the complaint process. So when the question arose as to whether the judge had been, been punished or disciplined for such behavior, um, fortunately, the press was able to say, even if this judge has been public, uh, punished at this point, we won't know because of the 
process and rules that are in place. And then finally, the media plays this key role in exposing these limitations by saying, we won't even know what is happening in this case if it is dismissed. And of course, the exposure of this limitation assists the public in understanding this process. But of course, it also undermines the public confidence in terms of what is happening. Next slide. So this really prevents, gets us to the key or to the question of judicial ethics. What are judicial ethics? What do we mean when we talk about judicial ethics? What is covered when we talk about judicial ethics? There are many who say, as long as the behavior is not legal, then it should be ethical. But we understand in examining the role and the conduct and the speech of judges that simply identifying behavior that is illegal is insufficient. Next slide. Another U US Supreme Court justice said it this way. His name was Justice Potter Stewart. He said, ethics is knowing the difference between what you have a right to do and what is right to do. Ethics is knowing the difference between what you have a right to do and what is right to do. So that when we think about the issue of judicial ethics, there will be conduct that may be perfectly legal. For example, writing a post like the judge did that we just discussed earlier. But is it the right thing to do for a judge who's being asked, to, who's being called on to make decisions of fairness in the lives of individuals. And that is what we mean when we talk about this issue of judicial ethics. Next slide, please. So when we apply judicial ethics, we know and come to understand that ethics or judicial ethics applies to both the standards and the norms of speech and conduct that bear on judges or that, is this, or that has been identified by the canons and code. In other words, it can cover the actual rule that says a judge cannot or should not engage in certain speech and conduct in doing their job. But it also can cover the perception of what this, their role or what their speech and conduct has resulted in. Next slide. So the okay. question comes, yes. I, I just wanted to share a comment that came in that I Excellent. think is important to share. It says, if, um, if a judge demonstrates conduct that defames the title of judge or undermines the authority of justice, such as morality, honesty, one of the grounds for disciplinary action established by the law of the judiciary and the status of judges. Excellent. Excellent. I couldn't have said it better myself. And that really is the essence as we look at this issue of what is judicial misconduct. Next slide, please. Thank you. So when we talk about judicial misconduct, what are we talking about? What do we mean? So speech, it, it, it really covers speech or conduct uh, that is prejudicial to the effective and expedient administration of the business of the court. What does that mean? It means anything that interrupts or interferes with the ability of a judge to do their job. For example, posting a post of, of, of such a, a nature as the judge did in the Texas case that talks about people and talks about a position in terms of political and politics and candidates. Secondly, is this speech or conduct that solicits special treatment a judge wanting things done for them because they are a judge. Now, of course, we realize that as judges, many things happen uh, or we are allowed to do by virtue of our, our position as judges. But soliciting this special treatment is the essence of misconduct by a judge. It is also speech or conduct that is prohibited by law. 
this really becomes the easiest way to determine whether misconduct has, a, has occurred. Is the conduct illegal? Is there a law that says you cannot um, do or say what you've said or done, judge? If it is prohibited by law, it is misconduct. And next, conduct that is patently egregious and hostile. I think when we um, talk about conduct that is egregious and hostile, the very essence of that is captured again by the post that we referred to earlier where the judge talks about uh, a million fat women and getting them out and getting them walking. There's nothing, um, the, the statement is, is both egregious and hostile to women or to people who, who may feel different in terms of, of the political candidate. And finally, behavior that violates the mandatory standards of judicial conduct. Um, and when we talk about the mandatory standards of judicial conduct, we're not just talking about the code of judicial conduct, but the rules of evidence, the law that the judges are expected to follow in their jobs. Uh, next slide, please. So we get to our next polling question. This talks about the judge as the subject of disciplinary proceedings. And the question on the poll, when should a judge be subject to discipline? Only for conduct, speech and conduct while on the bench, but not for private speech or conduct? for speech and conduct while on or off the bench are only for illegal speech and conduct. So if you can take the poll at this time, when should a judge be subject to discipline? Only for speech and conduct while on the bench, not for private speech and conduct while not on the bench for speech and conduct while on or off the bench, only for illegal speech and conduct on or off the bench. And Judge, while we're waiting for the answers to come in for the poll, there was another comment that came in that said, the point is that the plan of requirements of ethical order for a judge is somewhat higher than for the ordinary citizen. That's why I have the right doesn't always mean the action is correct from an ethical point of view. Absolutely, absolutely. Excellent comment, thank you. Excellent con comment. <clears throat> 10 more seconds. Excellent. We have um, a few uh, saying that only con only for private conduct. Um, most of you finding that for speech and conduct while on or off the bench. And then um, a, a few of you saying that only for illegal speech and conduct. So if we are going to publish judges, punish judges, for their speech and conduct. Next slide. The question really becomes for us is how do we, how do we, how, how will we decide how to punish a judge? How would we determine what is a violation? I, I think judges, as we look at the, the, your responses in our, in our last poll, it, it really um, exemplifies the issue as, as it relates to how will we determine which conduct to punish? Is it conduct in my private life? Is it conduct while I am on the bench? And I think all of us would agree, clearly any conduct that occurs while on the bench 
would, 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 would be a violation or should be open to, to being the subject of violation. But private conduct, and the issue of private conduct becomes much more, um, much more difficult sometimes for some judges to know and accept. And I think our last comment uh, that we had in the chat really um, provides a good example of why it is judges that both on, on, on the bench and off the bench conduct can and will be subject to discipline. And that, in other words, what, what the, the, the uh, Code of Judicial Conduct has said is that we must provide clear and concise rules and instructions for determining what speech and conduct is prohibited. And the reason we talk about this, this need for clear and concise rules is just that. Because it, we are looking at conduct both on and off the bench, it becomes critical for a judge to be able to know and understand when they are subject, subject you know, what speech and conduct is being subjected to violation. Next slide. So the code of judicial conduct, uh, this model code um, that operates within the United States has four over, overriding principles that become key in assisting judges in knowing and understanding uh, when their speech and conduct may be subject to violation. And I want to look at these four principles, not in great detail, because of course um, they, they apply in the United States, but as a guide to knowing and understanding when um, your conduct and when your speech may be subjected to discipline. The interesting thing about this model code of judicial conduct, which is available, is that it provides not only the rule for judges to look at, it also provides comments that will look at that particular rule or canon, as we may call them, and, and give more specific examples or more detailed examples of the speech and conduct that will be violative. So canon one, the first canon, next slide. A judge should uphold and promote the independence, integrity, and impartiality of the, the judiciary and shall avoid impropriety and the appearance of impropriety. So as we look at this code, we really get to see the very uh, basis for the, the position that both the perception and reality or actuality of, of conduct becomes subject to discipline for, for judges in the United States. Because of course, this look at, looks at the judge's ability to comply with the law. But in talking about independence, integrity, and impartiality, it's also looking at how that conduct may impact on the prestige of the office what people think about the judge and of the actual um, completion or, or, or duties that the judge is performing. Next slide, please. Canon two says that a judge shall perform the duties of judicial office impartially, competently, and diligently. And it is to this canon that judges look not only to your behavior on the bench, so it covers um, looking at the adherence to the rules of the court, um, impartiality and fairness, um, looking at the issue of bias, prejudice, and harassment. And when we talk about the, 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 the bias, prejudice, and harassment, it's not only of, of, in, of, of the judge, but of individuals in the court or appearing before the judge, both the lawyers, litigants, and witnesses, looking at external influences on judicial conduct. What is the judge involved in? What is the judge doing? Um, looking at the right to be heard of citizens as they appear in front of, of, of judges. Looking at the right to, to have judges not con comment on pending or impending cases. Looking at the demeanor of, of, of jurors and judges if, if people are being asked to make a decision about the case. Understanding the role of the judge as the supervisor, 
and 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 as such people that are are under the supervision of the judge acting responsibly as well looking at the um the ability or disability of the judge in terms of illness um and then last but not least responding to any sort of uh, misconduct so once accused the responsibility of a judge to 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 respond to any public or private inquiries as to me that may exist. Next slide. And then looking at um, Canon 3, the judge should conduct the judge's personal and extrajudicial activities to minimize the risk and conflict with judicial obligations. Now, as you look at this Canon, what you should see evolving is a pattern. And this pattern is that judges are under scrutiny, both on the job and off the job, on the bench and off the bench. And in the event that this is not clear, Canon 3 makes it clear. It looks at the personal and extrajudicial activities. So we're not even talking about activities that you may be um, or speech that you may be pursuing or engaging in as a judge, but what you're doing in your personal life and your extrajudicial life. And this canon making clear to judges that you are under the rule of the code of judicial conduct in terms of, of your, your conduct uh, and your actions, um, but providing the basis for doing that. And finally, next slide, looking at canon four. And this was, uh, really looks at judges as, as candidates for judicial office and, and, and indicating that a judge should not engage in, in political or campaign activity that is inconsistent with the integrity and impartiality of the judiciary. Now, in looking at this particular canon, um, what you'll see in the United States is the difference in terms of how judges are selected, uh, determining how this particular canon would apply. For example, in our last selection of Justice Barrett um, in our, in, as a Supreme Court justice, um, we, we noticed that, that many people were being lobbied. Many of the legislatures were being lobbied in terms of, terms of their vote. Um, and that Justice Barrett was, was meeting or, or, or met with many individuals in terms of, of her, or her uh, candidacy. Um, and such meet, those meetings were not found to be in violation, but there are um, limits to what the justice or prospective judges could, justice could say. And you saw that in terms of how she answered questions in terms of how she would rule on particular cases. Um, and it is this engagement in both political and campaign activities that became key. Next slide and our next poll. So let's look at the judge as the reporter of misconduct. The judge as the reporter of misconduct. And let's get to our poll question. Next slide. What conduct should a judge ethically be required to report? So what conduct should a judge ethically be required to report. Our first comment is the misconduct of lawyers who appear before the judge, illegal conduct of lawyers and litigants that appear before the judge, misconduct of judges that appear before the judge, misconduct of lawyers and judges that appear before the judge. So I want you to think about um, each of these, these um, responses in terms of which one best represents what a judge, what conduct a judge, and when I say conduct, I mean speech or conduct that a judge should ethically be required to report what speech or conduct.
Only участники 15 секунds, and we закрываем. 15 seconds more, and we'll close the poll. Very interesting results. So we have four uh, percent, a small, a small percentage, saying the misconduct of lawyers who appear before the judge. A, a twenty-five percent saying illegal conduct of lawyers and litigants who appear before the judge. Um, a smaller percentage, nine percent, saying the misconduct of judges that appear before the judge. And then our largest percentage saying the misconduct of lawyers and judges that appear before the judge. So I'd be interested in hearing comments, um, if anyone has any within the chat, why you uh, took the position that you did. So why, why would only illegal conduct between litigants and, and judges um, be, be that appear before the judge? Why would you feel that judges, um, and I think that was our second choice, why would we feel that, that, that judges should not report other judges? Or it could be that in looking at that statement, it's, well, illegal conduct should be reported um, in addition to misconduct as well. And the misconduct of judges that appear before the judge or that occurs in the presence of the judge. We know there's a very small percentage. So why, in fact, that'll be the question. Why would why shouldn't we report the misconduct of judges that appear before uh, that, that judges are aware of? I guess we don't really appear before them, but that judges are, are, are aware of. Should you be required to report the misconduct of judges? that you are aware of. And if you can tell me in the chat why you think we shouldn't report or I get um, or, or why we should report this misconduct. And I'll wait for the comments to come in in the chat and we'll take a couple before going on. I cannot see any comments so far in the chat. Indeed, aren't. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, yes, well, yes. Let's go on. Because here we're okay. talking about uh, here. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Here we're talking about ensuring reputation, not only of a specific judge, but first of all about the reputation of the institution, judiciary as a whole. And I certainly think that captures the essence of the position of judges reporting other judges. Um, in, in fact, the Code of Judicial Conduct, next slide, actually specifically refer, um, references both a judge's responsibility to report other judges and a judge's responsibility to to um, report lawyers in terms of conduct. And what it says specifically in relevant part is that the knowledge that another judge has committed a violation of this code raises a substantial question regarding the judge's honesty, trustworthiness, or fitness um, as a judge in other res respects. And a judge shall inform the appropriate authority. And that if a judge receives information indicating a substantial likelihood that another judge has violated the rules, that they shall take appropriate action. The key thing, the key thing that we note in looking at this responsibility of, of judges um, uh, in terms of reporting is that it's not an actual responsibility to report the judge, but a responsibility to take 
appropriate action. And this, this taking of appropriate action on the part of judges can include reporting it to um, a superior judge if, if, or a higher judge, um, confronting that judge and saying, I observed this, I have concern about this behavior in terms of being viola a violation or reporting that judge to the, the appropriate authorities. Um, you know, and there is a thought or opinion that requiring judges to report each other may interfere with the collegiality or relationship of judges as they relate to each other. And, and, and it certainly is a valid concern in terms of what happens. Next slide. And, and likewise, the responsibility of, of judges as it relates to um, the conduct of lawyers is again. Judge, I'm just going to jump in. I'm sorry, but we need yes. to go to, to slide 32, please. Thank you. Thank you. So what each of each of these um, the, the, these particular uh, aspects of the model code talk about is the responsibility of a judge to inform the appropriate authority as it relates to lawyers and to take appropriate action. And this, this applies whether it relates to the conduct of another judge, a lawyer, requiring the judge to take the appropriate action. So the thing to note when we talk about appropriate action though, is that it doesn't always mean reporting it um, uh, turning the, the, the person in. And, and, and our rules of professional conduct have found taking appropriate action to include such thing as talking to the person, referring it to a local um, committee or to a committee of, of judges or lawyers in terms of handling that behavior. Um, let's go to our next slide, 33, in terms of our fourth poll question, deciding judicial misconduct. Poll question four. And our next slide. Because if we if we look at then all of this behavior uh, in terms of what should we be reported and who should be reported, um, who should determine if a judge engaged in speech or conduct in violation of judicial ethics? Our question becomes who should decide? And our first choice is judges should decide. Next, lawyers and judges should decide. Third, public members should decide. Fourth, lawyers and public members should decide. And then our final option, judges, lawyers, and public members should decide. And this question really leads us into our discussion of how these how disciplinary uh, proceedings should take place and who should be involved in those proceedings. You have 10 seconds, participants. We'll close the poll. <clears throat> so we have kind of a division. 37% uh, said the judges should decide. Um, if a judge is engaged in speech and conduct, um, only 8% thought that lawyers and judges should decide. Only 3% um, felt that public members should decide. Um, no one felt that lawyers and public members, but the majority looking at, at, at this composition of judges, lawyers, and public members being the individuals that sh should decide. Um, and, and, and that position, which was the majority of positions answering the poll, um, next slide please, becomes the position of best practices as we talk about 
who should be involved in a disciplinary proceeding. And the model code provides for this, 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 um, this, this, this best practice by looking at both the composition, who should be on the panel, how, and how the panel should conduct itself. So what happens in this best practice of, of disciplinary proceedings is we look at the composition and, and the, the decision is that both public members, lawyers and judges should be involved. And the interesting thing that, that happens is even that commission then is divided between a, uh, an investigation panel and a hearing panel. The investigation panel being the panel that, that will investigate or look at the case and the hearing panel being those that will actually hear the, um, hear the issue of the violation and determine the violation. And then finally, the, 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 uh, portion, the sanction portion and we'll look at the sanction. Next slide. So who is on this commission? Under the best practices in the United States, one of the things that had happened is that, that there are 12 members of the investigative, of the, of the commission. Um, and then of this commission, four are members of the intermediate court or trial courts, four are members of the, um, uh, are lawyers who are, are practiced, and then four are public individuals who are not lawyers or judges. Now, interestingly enough, if you notice the intermediate and the trial court Judges are represented on the board, but the Supreme Court is not represented on the commission. They cannot be on the commission. And this is, and this is because the Supreme Court will ultimately review, approve, or disapprove of the decision that is made in a particular case. Next slide. So the participation, and it is felt truly that the participation of the public uh, serves to increase the confidence um, in the judicial discipline system. And it really is, is enhanced when public members are a part. Um, and having public members be a part of the, the commission provides uh, them with an important perspective um, of, of how such conduct is, is being examined and, and, and what should take place. And the most important reason why this participation of, of the public becomes so important um, is, is, is that it avoids this, this appearance of a closed system where only lawyers and judges are, de are deciding uh, if these, if these violations has taken place and that the public has no say or no, no uh, ability to do anything about it. Next slide, please. So what happens then at this first stage? What happens at the beginning of, 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 of the report of this case is that there's a screening, then there is a preliminary investigation that looks at the, the issue as it relates. Um, and many times the preliminary investigation may lead to a total dismissal of, of what has happened. Um, this can then be followed by a full investigation um, in, in terms of the, the um, conduct or speech. Um, and, and, and again, many times um, the, uh, the conduct or speech or investigation may result in, in a disposition after this full investigation um, and then finally, possible criminal prosecution for judges for their particular conduct. Um, and, and it is felt that, that providing this, this increased screening and investigation uh, increases the likelihood of, of the uh, confidence of the public um, in terms of the behavior that is being examined. Next slide, please. So the investigative panel um, is, is uh, three members. So when they have this investigative panel and the, the hearing panel, remember there are 12 total, three members serve on the investigative panel and they are separate from the remaining nine members who serve on the um, hearing panel that will actually hear the case. And on this investigative pan panel are one, a representative from each of the, the um, entities. So there's a judge, there's a lawyer, there was a public member. And of course they engage then in that screening process that we talk about, reviewing the recommendation, um, sending it for a full investigation or deciding that this is not a valid complaint. Um, and and, and it, it reviews, it, it works with a, um, um, a lawyer that works for the, the, the panel or for the, the commission 
um, in terms of approving or disproving or modifying this recommendation. And the reason this separation becomes so important is because these members then will not be a part of the actual hearing of the case that will take place. Next slide, please. So the hearing panel then becomes the remaining nine members who have the duty and the authority to, to rule on any sort of motions or anything that is happening on the case to conduct hearings um, on the final charges in front of in, uh, for that particular judge. And then to make findings, conclusions, or recommendations, again, going to the highest court, who is not a part of this panel and has not been a part of the panel. Next slide, please. And of course, at this point, we then review the grounds for discipline and review what can um, and should be examined in terms of the speech and conduct of the judge. So any conduct constituting a violation of the code um, or the rules of evidence or the rules of professional conduct or rules as they exist um, automatically can, can constitute a ground for discipline for the judge. But it also can be a violation of a valid order, um, an order for, from, from the higher court instructing a judge or saying this is the law in a, in a particular case. We saw that with judges in the US um, until the law became that same sex couples um, could get married, judges could, would opt out of or choose not to follow valid orders that they have to conduct the weddings if asked to do so or conduct no weddings. Um, so that the misconduct became a violation of a valid order, the order that, that same sex individuals could now be, uh, become married. Finally, a willful failure to appear personally or as directed. So during the process of the investigation, um, not a, appearing or responding becomes an additional violation. Uh, and then the knowing failure to respond to a lawful command from any disciplinary authority can subject judges to discipline. Um, next slide, please. So the conduct of a hearing. All of the testimony, of course, would need to be under the, the oath. Uh, under oath. The disciplinary counsel would present the, the, the evidence to the, the, uh, the uh, evidence of the violation, and then the parties are permitted to both examine and cross-examine, um, and a record is kept of the findings as, as, as they have occurred, or the findings um, that any findings that are made. And this really completes the process in terms of what happens. So how is how let's, let's look back at, at, at the whole process. Next slide, please. In terms of how um, is judicial conduct re reported and how does one file a complaint? Next slide. And the that what happens in terms of a complaint. Judge Kutay, you did yes. Kutay, sorry. In chat, we have uh, a question. I will uh, read it now in Ukrainian. Excellent. If you can read the question. How the public representatives are selected uh, in order to make sure that uh, these individuals do not have criminal record or uh, previous uh, um, sentences, etc. I mean, how do who is selecting uh, or uh, uh, conflict of interest because of their relatives. How is this regulated? How are the public representatives selected? Okay, so public representatives are selected by the governor or the, or, or the head of, of, of state. So they would be presidential appointments in, in terms of um, a, a federal board, but in, in the state, they are selected by the governor and, and they, are, they apply and they are vetted or investigated um, in terms of their roles, um, who they are, um, and the the governor of each state actually appoints the members of the the uh, commission, and that's how the public members. And now the private the, the 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 attorney members are selected by the bar association or our regulatory authorities for lawyers, and they actually select individuals that would serve on the disciplinary committee uh, for lawyers. And then judges or judicial bodies then select members of their own from um, 
to, to serve on the, the, on the commission. For each of these entities, there are requirements that the judge cannot have been the subject of, of discipline, um, cannot have been punished or involved in a disciplinary process. Um, and the, 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 the same is true for lawyers. Um, and it is for that reason, um, if, you, if you really think about it, why it's important that the initial uh, complaint stage may sometimes be confidential. Because you can imagine that many judges receive complaints because people simply do not like their decision. These complaints are, are, are easily reviewable and are in fact reviewed and are dismissed. And in my particular state, judges are never aware of, of these kinds of complaints so that a judge can, can answer yes, that they have never been, been investigated or disciplined. And the reason the confidentiality becomes so important at this stage is because it is so, um, so open to improper influence and simply coming from a, a person that is trying to um, find fault without real reason. So for that reason, many of the initial complaint stages um, are, are, are confidential and even confidential from the judge who is the subject of it. And they never know that they've been the subject of an initial complaint because it's been easily found to have not apply. So when we think about, um, great question, thank you. So when we think about this, this issue of step one, signing the complaint, who should receive the complaint? There are all, all different avenues for how uh, the complaint reach, reaches the, the commission. Uh, members of the public, like our judge in Texas, and we're gonna look at that more in detail, uh, replain, complained about um, the post of the judge. Now the judge immediately took the post down we know that in, 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 on, on cyberspace, there's no such thing as a delete. And of course, the comment was still able to be there. The press can also report such conduct by their publicizing um, or the public nature or, or publication of the information. Other judges can become the source of a complaint. And then for, for some judges, they simply report themselves when they realize they've made a mistake or realize that they have participated in a conduct that may be subject to dis discipline, they report themselves. So, so, there are all, so there are different avenues by which this conduct can be reported. Uh, next slide, please. So in looking at the conduct, and I'm, I, I'm going back to the case that we used, this was the, the judge that filed the post. And, and these were the comments then that, that were, were filed. Um, I noticed you deleted the derogatory comment you made about women. Good thing I saved a screenshot. Good notice to us that there's no such thing as things that disappear. Um, and so even though the judge had, had, had posted the conduct, um, he did not apologize for the conduct, but he did delete the, the statement. It, it could then become the subject of discipline. Next stage, next, next, next um, slide. So what is the public's right to know? And what is the level of, of, of this, this, this knowledge that the public should be able to have? And that brings us to our, our next polling question. Uh, should the public be able to know that a formal complaint has been filed against Justice Mosley? So our judges in the, in the Texas case, should a judge know? Or should the public know? Yes, no or it depends on whether there was publicity about the violation. So yes, no, or depends upon about the publicity. So we have 33% saying yes, the public should know. 13% um, saying no. And then 54% are the majority of you saying that it depends on whether there was publicity about the violation. 
And again, remember I said how each state gets to decide um, whether such, a, such conduct um, has, 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 has occurred or misconduct has been reported. Um, in Texas, where this con conduct actually um, occurred and where, where there may or may not have been a complaint, there was no right of the public to know at, 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 at this point. Now, in, in, in my state, in Florida, because of the very public nature of the conduct and the fact that it had been covered by the press, our conduct, co our conduct commission will at least answer yes or no as to whether there is a complaint being, being filed. But you can see where it, it, it really would depend on whether such knowledge is, is, is openly and readily available to the public so that the public's confidence can be de decreased or, or lessened when they're, they're not told that something is happening. And, and, and that was the position I, I, I think that this our state takes in terms of why you would know if there had been such a public display of the conduct and a public report. Uh, but in Texas, um, the conduct commission would not answer the question. Now the investigate, but what would happen at that point, so we have the conduct, next slide. It goes to the investigative panel, who then reviews the campaign to, to determine whether the allegations constitute a breach, breach of the judicial canons. And then if yes, we would go to step two, and if no, then they would be immediately rejected. It's here where we note that in a state like Texas, uh, because if they find no conduct, misconduct has occurred, we would never know about the complaint. There would never be a, uh, a yay or nay or yes or no about whether the conduct has, has happened um, and no further information would be provided. However, next slide. What, what they would do in looking at the, com, com, the conduct or speech is whether there is a possible conduct, a violation of Canon 1, Canon 2, Canon 3, or Canon 4. And of course, in looking at that, you know, does the activity uphold and promote independence, integrity, and impartiality of the judiciary or avoid the impropriety or appearance? Um, I think we can look at the conduct and say it probably affects the, the impropriety. Um, a judge, Canon two, a judge should perform their duties um, impartially, competently, and diligently. Um, you know, there, it raises the question as to the impartiality when the judge is call, causing, you know, a million fat women or, or indicating um, a, a particular feeling. And then three, a judge shall conduct their, uh, canon three, their, their extrajudicial, um, personal and extrajudicial activities. Um, so many times in, in looking at the, the conduct, the investigative panel will find the possible violation of one, two, and three and, and report it. In this case, probably not any sort of political um, violation, but to the extent that it named the president and looking at it, um, I, I think all of the canons can be reviewed as possible violation. So at this point, step three, the judge receives notice of the investigation. Uh, the subject job is issued a notice of investigation or notice of required appendant, uh, appearance. And in most US jurisdiction, the filing of this complaint um, in a public nature makes it now available to the public in terms of what happens. And they find that the, conf the, the confidentiality of the judge is not outweighed by the public's duty right to know. Next slide. Yes. So our next poll question, or is there an issue? It becomes when should confidentiality cease in formal judicial uh, proceedings? Which should confidentiality cease in formal judicial discipline proceedings? The first choice, when a formal complaint is filed, when the judge answers the formal complaint, when a hearing is held, um, after a recommendation of, of, of discipline in a particular case, and then after the court orders public discipline.
So if you look at the poll, when a formal charges, char charges are filed, when the judge answers the formal complaint, when a hearing is held after the recommendation for public discipline or after the court orders the public discipline. So the poll results are very interesting in terms of looking at, first of all, um, only 7% thought that it should, should become public when formal charges are filed. Um, no one thought that it would be after the judge answers. 11% said uh, when a hearing is held, 42%. Uh, so most of you thought after a recommendation for public discipline and a 40%, um, uh, so almost an even thought after the, the um, court orders the public uh, discipline. And in the United States, this has been the, the subject of some debate in terms of what happens. And interestingly enough, the majority of, of jurisdictions, next slide, in the, in the states, in the United States, find that after those formal charges have been filed against a judge, a judge that public right to know um, kicks in, that the public then um, is given the ability to know and understand about them. And even though as a judge, um, you know, there is the feeling that, 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 you know, if there is no public discipline, if there's no public recommendation for a discipline, like the majority of you looked at, that there should be no, no, no uh, publication or, or that the judge's confidentiality should, 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 should only cease when there's been some, a public recommendation, um, most, most of the judicial commissions in creating their commissions realize that if only those judges that were actually punished, uh, only those, those, those cases were ever brought to light, that it would really decrease the confidence of the public in the um, proceedings uh, of disciplinary proceedings against the judge, because at this point, conceivably, one could have had formal charges filed, answered those charges, and had a hearing and had no knowledge about what has happened. So the, the focus is really on the fact that during the, after formal charges, not just a regular, you know, not any allegation, but once there has been a formal charge and answer by a judge um, and, or, or a hearing that, that the confidentiality ceases. And the whole reason why we, we, we look at it in that way is the loss of public confidence or the understanding that the more that is done in secret, the more likely it is that there will be this loss of public confidence. Um, next slide, please. So in the appearance before the council, our fourth step, um, side, our fourth step, the judge appears before the investigative council and is allowed to provide an, answer, an explanation and an answer. Um, so that even if the public would not know about this, the media coverage would a lot of times tip them if they're in one of the, the states where now the formal knowledge is known, uh, an answer has been filed and we're holding a hearing. Uh, next slide, please. And then our fifth stage is this probable cause of determination as to whether a violation has occurred. It determines whether there's probable cause, uh, whether to institute the formal proceedings and if probable cause is not um, filed, found, the case is dismissed and passed for further, further investigation. But if probable cause is found, then we actually go to the formal hearing. Next, next slide, please. Or the um, preparation for the formal hearing. Now, it is at this point, the preparation or stipulation for this hearing, that a judge can um, work out an agreement in terms of a punishment or work on an agreement in terms of a sanction or try to reach a stipulation or agreement in terms of san sanction. But even if they're able to, to reach an agreement, um, this agreement has to be approved by the Supreme Court, by the highest court, the members that must approve. And then finally, next slide, um, that in conducting the hearing, It's required that the, um, the conduct be made open to public, that the public be allowed to hear or be present for such um, 
pre proceedings or the process in terms of a hearing. And interestingly enough that it then still must be presented to the, the Supreme Court who can then reject or modify or, or approve the recommendation of the hearing panel. Um, and you can see why it is so important or, or why it is, is, is determined to be so important that the hearing process be separated from the investigative process. The members that investigated the case and presented are not a part of this hearing process that will make the determination as to whether there is a violation. Um, next slide, please. And the actual hearing and how this hearing is conducted, um, next slide, the, this is it, looking at the right to reasonably be heard, uh, the, the judge can be represented by an attorney, uh, there will be issuance of subpoenas, and more importantly, a transcript or recording of this proceeding is made. Next slide. So the possible sanctions for judges in a, a um, judicial misconduct proceeding. Um, so next slide, there's a flow chart that looks at them. Judge Cote? Yes. Your um, audio completely you lost you on audio for a for just a few for that last when okay. you started talking about the flow chart. Yeah, okay, yeah, great. we translated, we trans, we trans, translated this flow chart and uh, it is now in folder with materials. Шановні учасники, ми переклали оту схемку, на яку було посилання. Yes, they're saying that this uh, uh, flow chart was translated and they can find it in their respective materials of the line. Okay, perfect, the perfect, yeah. So we'll look at the possible sanctions and starting with the least severe, uh, or, or um, which is just a private uh, admonition by an investigative panel. Remember that panel that 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 simply looked at the the facts to determine whether the judge had 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 committed a violation. They could simply send a private letter to the judge indicating you were investigated for this, such, such conduct is prohibited. Um, the next step up uh, in terms of severity is a de deferred discipline agreement or an agreement um, by the investigative panel that we will not punish you if you do not repeat this behavior or if you stop um, participating in this behavior. And then the most severe being a public reprimand where the public is, is present, is done in, in the court um, um, and the, 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 the discipline of the judge is announced at that time. Uh, next slide, please. Further penalties can include limitations on the performance of the judge's abilities, um, discipline um, in, the, in the name of, of suspension or removal um, from, from the bench being the most severe of punishments um, that, that is possible. And finally, in looking at, next slide, in looking at, at um, punishments, many, many commissions have then utilized um, an interim suspension. And this is usually behavior um, where a judge is facing possible criminal prosecution. And it's felt that the criminal prosecution will be sufficient so that there's no need for commission action or behavior in terms of what can and should take place in a particular uh, proceeding. Next slide. So, so what we know and understand in terms of looking at judicial um, disciplinary proceedings is that a public process for these proceedings tends to transform the judicial uh, discipline and the issues of this, uh, judicial discipline from this secretive game to one in which the judicial commission's judgments are open to scrutiny um, and improvement by the pro as the process progresses. So, so it becomes key to know and understand the importance of the, the open or at least appearing or being open in terms of the process. And finally, an understanding that the public's confidence in the judiciary and in the disciplinary proceeding uh, holds them accountable and requires nothing less as we think about it. I'd like to thank you, uh, next slide, for your attention and I'm open for any comments or questions that you may have at this time. Thank you very much.
Any questions or comments? Шановні учасники, будь ласка, у нас ще є близько 20 хвилин. Ще participants we still have about 20 minutes. You have an opportunity to ask your questions. Let me start if I may. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable uh, 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 Judge uh, Cote, for your presentation. I think that uh, all uh, the participants who listen to your presentation now understand very clearly the uh, difference between the U.S. system and Ukrainian system. And actually, we know that you have 50 states, but we could see this confidentiality requirement uh, probably that applies in all states. Uh, this uh, confidentiality of the fact that a complaint has been uh, filed uh, uh, I've lost audio. Just a moment, I'll, I'll, I'll specify oh, okay. the question. Uh, well, okay, the question was... If you can... Yes, okay. Uh, can you repeat it in English if you want? Because I couldn't hear the Ukrainian. Sorry. Nope. So my question, probably the question was, as far as I could hear it, whether the fact that the complaint has been filed, uh, if it is published, does it undermine the um, trust to the judicial system? Right. Don't you think that whether it's the right thing to do right. to really disclose this fact? Right. I, I thank you for the question. And I think there is um, a divided opinion in terms of when the complaint should be made public. Um, I think there is a overwhelming opinion uh, and it is a fact that every complaint should not be made public because many complaints are very specious or simply because an individual did not like um, what a particular judge said or did in a particular case when the particular conduct was totally legal and ethical. Um, it is for that reason in looking at um, all complaints not being made public, um, that support from the commissions uh, is strong that all complaints not be made public. However, um, deciding that once a formal complaint has been filed, um, deciding to keep it private at that point, uh, created in the minds of many commissions, um, a feeling that the public would think judges are simply trying to cover for each other or high behavior. Um, so once there is a finding, um, formal finding, and, and, and this formal finding would be simply be made by that investigative panel. So they throw out or dismiss many complaints that never come to light um, for, for many of the judges for good reason. But at the same time, the filing of that formal complaint in most states being seen as, a, as an important uh, place and an important time where that particular violation must be made public. Because there's already per this perception on the part of the public of that lawyers and judges cover for each other, that lawyers and judges hide things, that lawyers and judges cannot be trusted. And it is this public confidence um, that, that must be promoted and it is in the, um, with the mind of being able to promote public confidence that this position is, is, is that once a formal complaint is filed, that this knowledge should, that it should be made open to the public. There is another question in the chat. How often the American judges are disciplined, are subject to disciplinary sanctions. How often? What is the statistics? The percentage is, is, is it, the percentage differs from um, federal to state. Federal judges um, are, are disciplined rarely. And when I say federal judges, I mean judges whose jurisdiction is for all the United States. 
They are selected by the president of the United States and they serve for a lifetime. Um, and as such, uh, discipline becomes more difficult when looking at federal judges, although it does happen. Um, in the instance of, of state court judges, um, successful discipline and the percentage of discipline, um, I, I, I can't give you a percentage that differs from state to state, but generally when I'm looking at them in the United States, um, several hundred are, 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 dismiss, are, 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 are punished, perhaps about Fewer than 10 are totally removed. Another 20 to 30 are suspended. And uh, the majority of them, when faced with discipline, will resign and not be subject to this discipline simply because they are, are they resigned. But the numbers are, um, are, are fewer than 10% in terms of courts, but the numbers can, can are consistent in terms of removal or suspension being the, the, the least amount of penalty that you see, but the public ad admonitions or private admonitions being high in terms of judges being disciplined. Uh, Another question. Uh, Thank you. Could you share your experience on whether ever any judge was punished by mistake? I mean, disciplined by mistake uh, uh, due to wrong accusations. Uh, and what was the impact uh, over the trust of the judiciary? of such cases. So before I can truly answer the question, I, I, I think I have to um, probably come up with a baseline of what is meant by mistake. If, if we're saying the judge was, was accused in error and that the, the facts that were presented were, in not, were in fact untrue, or unfounded, um, I think for some of us, we, we don't see that as a question of mistake, but a question of the process reaching the end of the, 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 um, the procedures in terms of what happens. Um, I think the fact that many judges are, are not told about every complaint, I think those, those dismissals of every complaint, um, frivolous complaints, um, are, are the dismissals that we don't see and the dismissals that are done in such a way as to encourage um, confidence in, in, in the judiciary. Because the feeling is, is, is some of those are, are, are just not valid and judges are never told about them. Um, and to the extent that those are the errors, um, I, I think the dismissal of those becomes support for the public confidence in the, in the, in the decision. That is also, they also serve as, as um, evidence why this investigative, this investigative panel is so important. Those three individuals who are a part of the investigative panel, and remember, it is a judge, a lawyer, and a public member. They are looking at all of the complaints as they come in. They are looking at everything um, as it comes in. And they make a determination that some of this, some of these complaints will never see the light of day, will never be seen by the public, will never be seen by the judge. And I think there is a valid concern that if every single complaint were publicized, um, that would be a mistake. Because a lot of, you know, I, I remember a complaint um, being filed, uh, um, filed or a, 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 a concern being filed by an individual um, who said that, that um, that the, the, the court was involved with their spouse. And what the individual didn't realize is, is, is that the, the person was in the courtroom and they didn't even know the, the person. So it, it was clear that it was a, it's a false allegation. 
But you can only imagine had that judge been, been accused of being a relate in a relationship with that person when it was clearly a false or made up, up claim. So I, I, the role of that invest, investigatory or investigative panel becomes very important in getting rid of, of such frivolous or clearly false claims. And I think that provides the, the kind of insulation uh, that is needed for the, the balance of the public confidence. Another question. Is the principle of proportionality applied when the disciplinary sanction is decided by the respective authority and which criteria may have impact over the final decision, like aggravating um, uh, circumstances or, I mean, how they decided? Right. So the, our, our courts here take a very dim blue view of judges who are accused of being dishonest, judges who are accused of, of, of lying, lack of candor, judges who are accused of criminal behavior. So that many times, even if these, the recommendation um, of the, the, the hearing panel is that the judge be suspended for a period of time, and, and, and usually there's a cost payment to the cost of the investigation, our highest court will, will generally remove such judges because they feel, and they've, and they've indicated over and over again, that a, a lack of candor uh, on the part of the court, um, a, an engagement in criminal behavior on the part of the court is egregious and as such um, requires the highest highest possible penalty for the court. And when I say court, I mean that judge who's being accused of such behavior. Now, when the behavior is attached to um, illness, um, perhaps um, substance abuse or, or something for which the judges can be treated, um, sometimes judges will be given the opportunity to enter treatment with an evaluation of, of their abilities after that, but still placed on a probation by the highest court. The highest court just really, um, the removal for a candor, you know, involvement in criminal behavior um, across the board becomes reasons uh, that judges will not be allowed to sit. And it only result in those judges um, retiring before it happens. We had a judge here that was accused of of, of choking, uh, you know, shaking um, uh, a court employee in, 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 in frustration. And I mean, they, it was not done in, in, in any way that hurt the individual, but our courts didn't care. They said the mere engaging in that kind of criminal behavior is so egregious that you're not gonna be able to allow to, to serve as a judge. And this person was actually removed or suspended pending a final determination which was further indication that the court found such behavior so egregious that they're saying, until we hear this, we don't even want you on the bench. We don't think it's safe that you be allowed to sit on the bench um, even though this behavior is pending uh, in terms of the, the investigative board or the, of the hearing panel on it. So they, will, they do look at the seriousness of behavior in terms of that kind of determination. Uh, a couple more questions and we'll conclude. Right. What most often are the grounds to discipline a judge in the United States? Excellent question. The most common grounds for judges is their demeanor. Improper demeanor either with another, a lawyer with people that appear in front of them. So in, in yeah, so issues of, of speech and conduct that indicate a lack of proper demeanor, it's the most common. And, and that will most times not lead to that removal of that judge, but will, will lead to discipline of that particular judge. 
but just the way they, 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 they respond to individuals, the way they talk to, to litigants that are, that are appearing in front of them, the way they talk to court, to, to lawyers that appear in front of them is the most common area of, of, of discipline. Thank you. Have you ever had cases uh, of non-ethical conduct of the board members? I mean, the board, the hearing board, the investigative board, maybe lawyers, judges, or even public representatives. Have you ever heard or maybe you have uh, seen situations when their behavior was not proper? I, I'm, I'm not familiar with any removal of board members, but I am familiar. I, I do know that that each of the boards prior to the cases must, must take an oath. And when they have a personal involvement, when they know an individual that's involved, they have to recuse or disqualify themselves from being involved in, in the actual case itself. Um, I'm not aware of any proceedings that have been instigated against board members but I am aware of instances where board members have had to be disqualify themselves or be disqualified either because of their knowledge and, and understanding of the case. So remember, the people that decide to be on these particular boards are individuals that have a, um, an express interest in discipline and upholding um, discipline and, and conduct. So it tends to be the lawyers and the judges and the public members that, that morally and ethically have committed themselves to behaving um, in such a way that separates them from, from other judges and lawyers and, and, and members of the public. Um, but, but they are required to and can be, be, be sanctioned or, or at least removed. And the sanction would be removal because there's no constitutional right to be on the, a member a part of the panel or a member of the panel. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, uh, I have another question. I have two questions, in fact. The first one, uh, esteemed Judge Kuti, who in the United States may file a complaint against the judge concerning disciplinary misdemeanor of improper behavior. Who can file such a complaint? Anyone. So remember in, 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 in the presentation we talked about, the complaint can from, come from a member of the public. It can come from other judges who observe the behavior. It can come from the press who publicizes the behavior and that, that, that press coverage becomes the basis. And, and more commonly, um, it comes from the judge. Sometimes judges mistakenly involve uh, themselves in behavior that they find may subject mm -hmm. them to discipline. And they wanna know, and they didn't mean to do it. Um, so they report themselves. We actually had a, a very huge case um, recently that involved uh, several judges signing a, um, um, signing a, a, a letter of support for an agency that was seeking to um, represent children in, in, in cases. And the, the agency that was seeking to represent um, the children was filing a proposal. And they asked the judges to do a letter of support of their proposals. And they had been, been involved in working with kids and appearing before the court. And they simply wanted the judge to write in support of their application in the proposal. And unknowingly, five judges signed on and five judges wrote a letter supporting uh, this particular agency that had been doing this for years. So the, the knowledge and the support of the agency was clear, but it was an application for a proposal. So there are possibly other individuals that are submitting proposals as well. So it then becomes a violation for judges to improperly use the weight and prestige of, of the judiciary to support individuals that may appear in front of them. Each of those judges end up self-reporting. They were mortified. They had no idea. One of the judges had been a judge over 35 years without a single complaint. 
And once they realize their error, because this, this, new pro, this was a new process, mm -hmm. this proposal, they were getting, you know, starting with a new program. Each of them self-reported um, and, and were, were mortified that they were involved in such, mm -hmm. that they had committed it. Once it was explained to them, they understood that this is indeed a violation. Um, and they were indeed sanctioned. I mean, now they were not removed. None of them were removed for it. Uh, but there were public acknowledgments of what, what had happened. It was covered by the press. Uh, the press also covered how well known and well thought of these judges were. And each of the judges talked about how they had no knowledge. And once it was explained to them, they realized this is, yes, I see now that we are lending our support to this organization um, against others who are possibly trying to, to get the same um, um, appointment. And, and they self-reported. Thank you, uh, Judge. That's a very bright example where the judge self-reports uh, if she or he believes that uh, he has done or she has done something wrong. My second question is: Did I understand you correctly that uh, this uh, um, board uh, <coughs> on compliance is formed by? three entities, the governor who offers uh, a representative from a public bar association and the council of judges who select a judge for such a board. Uh, how do they reconcile, <coughs> how these three entities can reach agreement about the actual fact of disciplinary uh, misconduct. They may have different views uh, on a lawyer or a public and see it differently from a judge. That's my question. So one of the ways that, that we handle that issue, um, and that's a great question. One of the ways we examine that issue is the, the board itself has its own counsel. It has its own lawyer that is familiar with the laws and rules as it relates. Um, and, and, and it is their job to instruct the board um, in terms of what is the rule, what is the law. Um, and so board council many times mm -hmm. has a responsibility of instructing and guiding, but they don't control the board um, in, in terms of how they, of decisions that are made on a, on a particular case. So, um, there is a, a charge that's given or a responsibility that's given to the board for all of the members, whether public, judicial, or, or lawyers. Um, and, and then they work under they work with the board council in terms of understanding what the laws or rules say uh, in support of a particular of, of, of a particular um, case or entity. But ultimately, it is only three that are on that investigative panel. And the three will have to hash it out in terms of reaching some sort of agreement. And then the remaining nine are on and they have to reach some sort of agreement. So the odd number will, will generally um, end up um, creating a natural division. But a lot of times they're trying to get unanimous support uh, once they look and understand and apply the facts. But they are, they come from, because you can imagine the, the, the governor appointments are usually very political. They will probably be the part, same party as the governor or president um, because that's how they get their 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 um, their support or appointment. And then you would have the the um, <laughs> judges who are appointed by judges themselves. And I thought you know highly of. And then the lawyers appoint their own from their own. Uh, but the board council operates with doing that for them. Another question. Uh, are these uh, board members allowed, or any one of them, allowed to have a dissenting opinion? Yes. Uh, if. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I'm very satisfied with your answers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and thank you for this opportunity May, to present before you today. Okay, so then as I, as a moderator, 
Um, I would like uh, to say some concluding remarks. Uh, Tim, to you, your honor, Judge uh, Colty, I think uh, all participants of this webinar will support me. So on behalf of the participants, I'd like to thank you for a very informative, highly professional presentation because you've given us very comprehensive picture of important and problematic issues concerning the disciplinary liability institution in your country. It's been very interesting for us because our mechanism for holding a judge liable is quite different from what you have. And uh, what we really like the, is that you illustrated all that with very good examples. And being a lecturer of university myself, uh, I teach uh, students of law. I know that it's very important to quote the very reputable authors. In particular, you mentioned uh, the Justice Stewart. Uh, here you mentioned his understanding of um, judicial ethics. We are very thankful to you for this lecture. And uh, now we are on the eve of Christmas. Uh, so let me wish you all the best, uh, strong health, uh, professional longevity, and all the best uh, to uh, uh, our life and more importantly may we have peace and win this coronavirus thank you all very much from the national judicial college it's been a pleasure working with you all and uh, we look forward to more partnerships in the future okay i also would like Absolutely. to step thank, thank you again for this opportunity thank you very much uh, your Honor, for your time uh, preparing and devoting and committing to teach uh, for Ukrainian judges. Happy uh, Merry Christmas to you and your family and Brooke, we joining you as well in this congratulation and appreciation for your absolutely generous support. Thank you very much, uh, my colleagues who invested a lot of their time in preparing all nine, uh, nine webinars and they have been working in cooperation with National Judicial College. Thank you, colleagues, Ничего and all the, best. all the best. And uh, I hope we'll see each other again on webinar in next year. Happy New Year as well. Bye-bye. Uh, yes, Natalia, I'd like to talk to Mrs. Sample, if I might, esteemed Mrs. Sample, I'd like to make a request for you. Could you please say hello and uh, uh, our thankfulness to William Bromson, who is director of special projects, and also to Joseph Sire, director for professional development uh, of the faculty. They conducted previous eight seminars impressed uh, with, and they really gave us uh, inspiration and uh, with their uh, uh, will to share their knowledge with Ukrainian judges. Now our school receives a lot of thanks for these webinars organized jointly with the American Judicial College. Our best wishes uh, and uh, our best wishes for Christmas. We are absolutely confident that uh, this professional uh, relations and friendship will continue and we do hope that our USAD project will uh, foster deepening of our professional relations and we'll have many other interesting meetings, interesting webinars and I wish we soon have time when the National School of Judges can share with your college uh, 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 our professional developments uh, along the path of uh, uh, professional development of judges. Uh, 
Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, we wish you all the best. Uh, good holidays. Uh, all the best to you.